My wife and I had been married for 22 years when this story takes place. Our two children, David 25 and Jane 23, are off on their own, and David is engaged. My name is Bob Lemon. My wife Rose had a dizzy spell one day and fainted the next. We had no idea why, so she went to our primary care physician to get a quick checkup. Our doctor said there are many reasons she could have this issue that are very innocuous, but that a blood screening was in order due to Rose being 45 years old. As we waited for the results, we decided to make the most of our time together and enjoy each other's company. We went on a romantic weekend getaway, rekindling the spark in our relationship. We reminisced about our past, laughed at old memories, and looked forward to the future. When the blood screening results came back, we were relieved to find out that there was nothing seriously wrong with Rose. However, the doctor suggested that she should make some lifestyle changes to maintain her health. We took this advice to heart and started making healthier choices together, such as eating better and exercising regularly. Throughout this experience, our bond grew stronger, and we realized the importance of prioritizing our relationship. We continued to make time for each other, even as our children grew up and moved on with their lives. We learned that no matter how long we've been together, there's always room for growth and new experiences. Rose has always lived a healthy life, only visiting the doctor for routine checkups. We were informed that the blood test was just being extra cautious. Fortunately, it came at the right time and proved to be very important. The doctor asked us to come to his office to discuss his findings. This raised concerns in my mind, but Rose seemed untroubled, so I tried not to worry her. He ordered a series of x-rays to be done as soon as we arrived. Now I was truly concerned, and Rose looked worried as well. What's going on, John? I inquired once Rose left the room. There are some irregularities in the blood work, he replied. We'll figure it out. When Rose arrived, she appeared to be more subdued and reserved. Our conversation was limited during that time. She mentioned feeling nervous, as did I. Following a considerable wait, John finally returned and took a seat. Rose, I need to share some challenging news with you. You have a small growth on your reproductive organ, but don't be alarmed. We detected it early, and the prognosis is favorable. There are two treatment options for you. First, there's chemotherapy and radiation therapy, which has a good likelihood of success, but can be demanding on you and requires time. It's not entirely effective, though. The second option, which I suggest, is a hysterectomy. Since you're 45, it's improbable you need your reproductive organ. This option is 100% effective, assuming there are no other growths elsewhere. We can delve deeper into it, but let's expedite the process to arrange everything. As I stepped out of my initial shock, I heard John say, Thanks, John. It sounds better than I had hoped for. Right, honey? Rose's face was pale and she was trembling, so I gave her a comforting hug. Everything is going to be fine, honey. The surgery went smoothly and no other growths were found. I took a two-week break to care for Rose during her recovery. I pampered her like a queen, cooking, cleaning, bringing flowers home, and talking for hours. It turned out that Rose's near-death experience led her to have a profound realization. Honey, we've been working nonstop just to have nice things when we die. I've been thinking a lot about this. I believe we should start living our lives more. We should go on trips or do things we've always wanted to do. I considered her point, but wondered if she truly believed she was close to death. I've noticed her tendency to be quite dramatic when speaking to her family on the phone. She often makes it seem like she's on the verge of a life-threatening situation. However, her family is generally quite theatrical. I couldn't help but agree with her reasoning. You're right, dear. Let's make the most of our time. We should create a list of experiences we want to have, both individually and together. The first item on our list should be the European trip we've been discussing for years. Let's make it happen. During my vacation and her recovery, we spent our time discussing our dreams and aspirations. Our financial situation was quite favorable, allowing us to pursue many of our dreams without significant financial strain. Travel was our top priority, as we both had places we wanted to visit. While on vacation, we quickly planned a trip to Europe for my next vacation in three months. We also created a bucket list of experiences we wished to undertake, ranging from dancing lessons to trying new cuisines. We made a comprehensive list, as we agreed that some items could be accomplished during evenings after work or on days off. I even included some of my adventurous ideas for our relationship, since we haven't tried them yet. I wasn't sure if Rose would be open to experimenting, but I thought it was worth a try. We have limited our intimate moments. In fact, I've only received two special moments early on in our marriage. 
I enjoyed the times I gave Rose a playful tongue massage, but I think she felt uncomfortable with the expectation of reciprocity, so she stopped letting me do it. Intimate touching has never happened, although the one time I gently touched her in that area during our moments together gave her a tremendous moment of pleasure. It's on my list of things to try. Rose took six weeks to fully recover. During that time, we couldn't engage in intimate activities, so I took her to a restaurant with a unique seafood dish on the menu to help us both cross it off our lists. It was a fun experience. The manager jokingly said, Suck the head and pinch the tail. I replied, That's for later, haha. Rose laughed, but not as much as I hoped. After dinner, we went home and had more non-alcoholic beverages, excited for our first special moment in six weeks. It felt a bit awkward since we usually let things happen naturally, but after six weeks, we were both eager. It was our first time since Rose's reproductive system had been altered, which was an unspoken situation that affected our intimate connection. We did share a moment, a pleasant experience that was somewhat less than exhilarating, but it marked a turning point in our relationship. Now, life could return to a sense of normalcy. Do you really want to explore all those experiences on your wish list? I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with trying those things, she said. At first it seemed self-centered of me. We've been married for a long time, and our intimate moments have remained consistent. I thought she would be eager to explore new experiences, but apparently not. No, I don't want you to feel pressured into anything you don't want to do. For my sake. I unintentionally phrased it to convey my disappointment, but it didn't have the desired effect. She simply moved on to other topics. As time went on, the wish list concept began to feel unbalanced. We continued to fulfill items from her list while none from mine were addressed. Perhaps I am the one being self-centered. At long last, our European adventure began. It surpassed all our expectations, rekindling the romance in our marriage for those magical two weeks. Our journey took us through Amsterdam, Germany, Austria, Italy, Switzerland, and France, culminating in a trip to London. We returned home, utterly exhausted, but with hearts full of joy after our incredible journey. During our trip and in the weeks that followed, we eagerly discussed our next destinations. As we couldn't take two-week trips very often, we planned two one-week excursions for the remainder of the year, with more adventures to come in the following year. We decided to go to Hawaii this year, taking a two-week vacation. After that, we planned to visit Australia, since both of us wanted to go there. We chose to go during the next winter, which would be summer in Australia. However, we still had one week left undecided. We were excited about planning these trips and looking forward to them. In the meantime, we focused on items on our list that we could do locally. One weekend, we went skydiving. I can confidently say I won't do it again, but we did it. This is where my story takes a turn. Rose came home from work one evening acting particularly nervous. After dinner, she brought up a question to me. Bob, I have a question for you. It might sound crazy at first, but just remember our motto, Carpe Diem, okay? I nodded feeling a bit nervous myself now. You remember Charlie Dunk, the guy I work with? I asked, curious about his co-worker. I've heard the name before, but I don't think I've ever met him, my wife replied, her hands trembling slightly as she fiddled with her wedding rings. Well, he's getting a promotion and is being transferred to Denver. His last day is Friday. We're having a going-away party for him at Margarita's at 6 p.m., and everyone is going, I continued, eager to share the news. My wife's face turned red, and she looked down at her feet. No, it's only for employees. The company is paying for everything, she said, trying to hide her excitement. I don't mind paying for myself, I said, still a bit confused about the situation. Can I go with you? Bob, Charlie, and I have been colleagues for around 20 years. We often engage in lighthearted banter, and he playfully flirts with me while I flirt back. Our dynamic is similar to that of a work husband. I have a question, and I'm open to any response you provide. I'd like to have a one-time sexual encounter with Charlie before he leaves for good. I could feel the blood draining from my face, my head, my neck, and my eyes began to fade. I remained in this state for a couple of minutes. Honey? I cleared my throat as the blood began to return. You, 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 I understand it's a lot to take in right now. Let's sleep on it. Things might seem different tomorrow. We can discuss it further during breakfast. I was certain my eyes were now leaking uncontrollably. I felt as if a sword had pierced my heart. Um, what do you need? I couldn't express myself properly at the moment. She was correct. I had to shatter her deceitful expectations in the morning. I spent time watching a 24-hour news channel for four hours and chose to pretend to sleep. 
Rose called out my name, but I didn't respond. She went to bed, and I settled in on the couch. I couldn't sleep. I continuously thought about how this situation had occurred. The entire seize-the-day concept had turned against me. Now she believes she can do whatever she wants. I began to notice some hints from my memory that seemed harmless at the time, like how she had been texting much more than usual recently. In the early morning, she came downstairs with a discontented expression on her face. You didn't come to bed last night, I mentioned. Well, I'm heading out to meet some co-workers before work. I've decided for you, I'll be attending the party tomorrow and returning Saturday morning. You will? I asked, still groggy from a sleepless night. I don't think that's a good idea. Are you just going to ignore my wishes? Everything will be fine, she assured me. On Saturday morning, we can discuss it over breakfast. You don't need to be insecure about it. We're adults in a long-term relationship, and everything will work out smoothly. Goodbye. As she opened the door, I tried to protest. But, but, but... But the door closed before I could finish. I chose to take a personal day from work to address my emotions. I reached out to my attorney to clarify my rights and obligations if the situation escalated. The locksmith arranged an appointment for 7 a.m. on Saturday to replace the locks, guaranteeing payment for his off-hours service. To keep myself occupied, I tackled various household chores throughout the day. I also began packing suitcases and boxes in anticipation of a possible move. Rose arrived home later than the usual time. Exhausted, I went to bed earlier than normal. As I changed into my pajamas, I spotted a box on Rose's dresser containing alluring lingerie. In our 22 years together, Rose had never worn such attire for me. Although I had purchased her pricey lingerie in the past, she had never donned it. I felt hurt and betrayed. I awoke from a deep sleep to a gentle kiss on my cheek. Remember, I love you, Rose whispered softly, her eyes filled with warmth. Rose, please don't do this. Don't throw away 22 years, I pleaded, my voice filled with desperation. Don't worry, I'm not throwing you away. I have to do this for me. You understand? I almost died, and now I can't pass up this opportunity. I have to go or I'll be late, she replied, her smile reassuring. Another tender kiss on my cheek, and she was gone. Determined to keep my mind off the situation, I went to work the next day. Luckily, nothing important was happening, and I was able to focus on my tasks. My good friend Brent noticed my distress and asked if I was all right. I shared my story with him, seeking his support and understanding. I'm sorry, man. Are you going to separate if she goes through with it? I nodded. I got home and prepared dinner for myself, which I couldn't eat. At least there will be leftovers for when things get hectic later. I decided that I had to see this person, Charlie, at least, and confirm that their plan was put into action. I left at seven, and by the time I parked and found my spot, it was almost eight o'clock. I figured it would last at least two hours. Margarita's is in a bustling downtown area, so I wouldn't be very noticeable. I sat on a bench across the street, which was in a surprisingly dark area. I waited patiently for over an hour before I saw a large group of people leaving all at once. They gathered near the front doors, exchanging farewells, and then warmly hugging a particular man. I couldn't help but notice that this man was shorter than expected, a bit out of shape, and had male pattern baldness. As people continued to leave, I saw Rose stepping outside. She and Charlie were the only ones left. I decided to start recording a video, just in case I needed proof later on. Rose wrapped her arm around Charlie and gave him a brief hug. They exchanged a few words before turning and walking down the sidewalk together. I considered making a scene to try and stop her, but it felt too desperate and unmanly. I realized that this was her decision, and I couldn't let myself grovel and beg. This was her choice to disrespect me. My stomach was in knots, and a wave of excitement washed over me. After walking just one block, they entered the hotel, and that was when my 22-year marriage came to an end. I knew I needed a break, so I stepped into Margarita's. I made my way to the bar and ordered a Dos Equis and a shot of Jose Cuervo Gold. The female bartender, Amelia, looked at me and inquired, You seem to be going through a challenging time, having a difficult day? It was late, and she didn't appear to be very busy. Since we've just met, you're the first to hear my story, I confided in her. Amelia stood there, her mouth open in astonishment. That was the woman who kept saying, seize the day, she exclaimed. That takes bravery. What are your plans moving forward? The locksmith will be at my house at 7 a.m., I said in a low, calm voice while removing the label from my soda. Can I get another round? This one's on me, she said. 
If I were 20 years younger, I would ask this pretty girl out. The reality of my situation struck me. A 47-year-old divorcee. I'm not unattractive by any means, but I knew now that I'd want to visit the gym more. It would probably do some good for my self-esteem anyway. I returned home with a slight buzz. Normally I wouldn't drive under these conditions, but my frustration kept me alert, albeit riskily. Once again I couldn't sleep all night. I decided not to lie in bed, and instead occupied myself by packing Rose's essentials and some non-essentials. I carefully stored all our wedding keepsakes in boxes, not wanting any reminders in the house. All of her belongings were placed in the garage. I sat in my recliner, not watching TV and waiting for something to happen. But nothing did. From 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., I paced back and forth. The locksmith arrived, and I was concerned that Rose might arrive early. Fortunately, there was no need for worry. After the locksmith left and my house was securely locked, I ate some leftovers. I placed a note on the door, informing Rose about the situation, and suggesting she seek legal advice. I contacted my father-in-law to alert him about the approaching storm. He was understandably upset. After I explained the reasons for the divorce, he became a bit more understanding. I informed him that Rose might need a place to stay. After 10 a.m., Rose finally arrived at her home, pulling into the driveway. As she approached the front door, she noticed it was locked, which was quite unusual for daytime hours. She cautiously stepped to the side and peered into the living room, trying to get a better understanding of the situation. Rose quickly grabbed her keys and attempted to unlock the door. As she inserted the key into the lock, she noticed a small note taped to the door. She carefully pulled it down and began reading. Her eyes widened as she reached the part about the locks being changed. Feeling a mix of confusion and frustration, Rose tried her key once more, but it wouldn't turn. She realized that the locks had indeed been changed, and she was now locked out of her own home. Bob, open the door. What's going on? Let me in so we can talk. She pulls her key out, knocks on the door, and finishes reading. I heard her gasp twice. She's starting to understand the reality of what I'm doing. She starts crying. Oh no, please, Bob, let me in so we can talk. Now she's pounding on the door. I don't want a divorce. I do feel a little bad for her. After 22 years with her, seeing her cry still hurts me. She pulls out her phone. It must have been turned off since a bunch of text chimes went off. They weren't from me. I didn't text her once. She's apparently reading them. Oh my goodness, she exclaims. She holds the phone to her ear. Dad, I'm really upset. She starts to cry softly. Dad, I'm locked out of the house and my partner wants to end our relationship. I tried to do something on my bucket list. It was carpe diem and we agreed to live life to the fullest. He can't be mad at me for that. I almost faced danger for goodness sake. She pauses for a moment. No, he didn't want me to do it, but I really wanted to. Another pause. Yes, Dad. I'll be there in a half hour. I love you, Dad. She hangs up the phone, presses a button, and then speaks into the phone again. Oh, come on. She types for a moment, and then leaves. My phone had been off since the locksmith left. I needed to give my attorney an update, so I turned it on. I had several texts and a missed call. The missed call and one text message were from Rose. Her text read, I'm sorry I didn't realize this was such a big deal to you. Please don't divorce me. We can get past this. Another text was from my father-in-law, Terry. It said, Son, I hope you respect me enough to stay in contact a little longer. Please let me talk to Rose and then I'd like the opportunity to call you if you'll allow it. I know how hard this is and I completely understand if you decide to go no contact. Nobody else will try to call or text you, I promise. My attorney suggested I get a new phone number to avoid any contact. I haven't done that yet, but if things become too difficult, I'll disconnect it. I can't function knowing I'm unreachable. I told Terry about my phone staying active until things get out of control. He understood and said he would come by to pick up Rose's things from the garage. Later that day, I received the call I was expecting from Terry, and I answered. Bob? Our family is hoping for one chance to discuss our problems. Would you be open to having a meeting at your house tomorrow? If you still want the divorce after our talk, you can serve her the papers at the same time. Well, I hadn't planned on anything like this. I'm not sure if my attorney would approve. If this is the fastest way to move forward, I'd be alright with it. I'll call my attorney and text you the response. Is that okay? That would be wonderful. You've truly been a great son-in-law. I'm sorry about what Rose did. I hope you know she still loves you very much. My attorney said it's up to me, but if I proceed with the meeting, he wants to be there. He wants it recorded, 
and warn me that this is a risky situation where sometimes the person going through the divorce gets involved in some sort of violence, which could severely hurt their case. I assured him that no matter what, I can control myself from any physical actions. I asked him to bring the divorce paperwork with him, and we agreed on a time. I sent Terry a message to inform him that I would attend the meeting, but only if my lawyer was present and we could record the conversation. I strongly suggested that the meeting occur at Margarita's at 11.30 a.m. on Sunday. He was pleased with the conditions and agreed to them. On Sunday, I was filled with anxiety. Although I wasn't the one who cheated, it didn't matter. Margarita's opens at 11 a.m. on Sundays, and when I arrived, the place was deserted. I informed Terry that the meeting would be at 11.30, giving us enough time to prepare. This must be the quietest time of the week. My lawyer George arrived at the same time as I did. We had booked one of the three private jail cell tables downstairs for privacy. As soon as he entered, George set up a tripod and camera and began recording. He had our divorce papers in his briefcase and patted me on the back. Are you ready for this? He asked, his face serious. I don't know how I could possibly be ready. I'm still in shock from everything. He nodded, and I observed the bartender, Amelia, from the previous Friday walk by, giving me a wink. I smiled for the first time in over two days. The in-laws arrived ten minutes earlier than expected, and everyone took their seats. Terry sat at the head of the table, while Rose sat across from me. My mother-in-law appeared angry. They also brought Rose's sister, Teresa. George initiated the meeting by having everyone sign a consent-to-record form, allowing us to record the conversation. Taking a deep breath, I said, All right, you may begin. Please present your reasons for why we shouldn't divorce, and I'll ask questions afterward. Does that sound fair? Everyone agreed. Terry began, On behalf of all of us, we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Rose feels caught off guard and saddened by your response to her actions. We all hope to persuade you to consider giving Rose a chance at reconciliation. Rose? He looked at Rose, who blushed slightly. I'm not sure how to start, she said. Firstly, I want to express my love for you again. We've shared 22 years of marriage and raised two wonderful children together. Should we not value all those years over one small incident? It was just one night out of over 8,000 nights. I wanted to live for the day, and that day was about celebrating Charlie. I'm sorry if it hurt your feelings. Emotion began to rise, and I couldn't help but feel touched as well, but I remained silent. My mother-in-law, Janet, still looked unhappy. She said, I don't understand why you have an issue with this. She warned you beforehand. She was open about it. It's not cheating if she told you. Plus, she came close to dying. You need to show some understanding and stop being so controlling. By the end of her speech, she was nearly shouting. I remained silent, deciding to let everyone express their opinions before I responded. George suggested this approach to avoid a heated argument. My sister-in-law, Teresa, seemed to have something to say, so I nodded at her, indicating she could continue. Bob, you know my husband Dave quite well, right? I nodded. Are you aware that he supports my decision to share experiences with others? I confirmed. Sometimes he watches and other times I come home and tell him about my experiences or show him a video. He enjoys it. If Dave can handle it, why can't you? We wouldn't have encouraged her if we thought you wouldn't be comfortable with it. I thought I misheard her. We? I asked. Yes, me and my mother. My eyes widened, and Rose looked down at her feet. Janet gasped, and Terry almost choked on his water. Terry was coughing as Janet exclaimed, Teresa! As if she had revealed a secret, Terry turned red in the face. You two? Oh my goodness, what did you do? Teresa replied, Daddy, it's all right. We were just supporting Rose's plan. We didn't come up with the idea. You two are unacceptable. You helped my daughter make a poor choice. Now she's going through a difficult time. I think this is a challenging situation for our family. I apologize for any discomfort this may cause. Bob, I understand if you need some space. We will always cherish the memories we've shared. I'm just so disappointed. He took a moment to collect his thoughts and then said, I'm sorry for any harsh words I used earlier. I was just so upset. Rose was visibly shaken by her father's words. I knew he usually supported me, but I was taken aback by his strong disapproval of the situation. He is a good man and seemed to still have my back. I have one more thing to say before we move on, Terry said. We came here to ask Bob to stay with Rose and to forgive her. I am no longer taking my daughter's side. If Bob wants to reconcile, that's wonderful but I won't force or pressure him to do so. It's not my decision to make. Teresa started to speak, but Terry interrupted her. Don't. I'm done. I'm angrier at you than I am at Rose. You have no right to egg her on like that. 
Rose, taken aback, replied, Honey, I truly believe that you would be upset for a short time, and then we could continue living our lives to the fullest. Please, can't we just move past this misunderstanding and be happy for many years to come? It seemed to me that the arguments on their side had come to an end. Now, it was time to address the main issues. I would appreciate it if I could speak without interruptions until I've finished, as I've given each of you the opportunity to share your thoughts. They all agreed. Initially, I'll discuss the reasons you've given for staying married, and then I'll express my own feelings. After that, I'll allow you to respond once more. Is that all right? They all nodded in agreement. Teresa, as your wife, you're cherished by your husband. Dave and I have talked about it. I'm happy to see his dream come true for him. I understand that many men have that wish. However, my own fantasy was to have a long, devoted marriage to a loyal spouse and grow old together. I believe it was a misstep for you to think I'd be fine with this. Moreover, I've never shown any interest in sharing my wife. I don't appreciate that you helped Rose rationalize doing this to me. She seemed embarrassed, and then cast a glance at her father, who was frowning. Janet, I said, and she appeared concerned. This truly took me by surprise. I can't believe you did it. I'm certain Terry has never encountered a situation like this. I noticed his reaction. And if he ever discovered the truth, your marriage would be in a precarious position, without a doubt. She also glanced at her husband's still somber expression. I must inform you that even if someone is open and doesn't conceal it, it doesn't automatically make it proper. She informed me she was going to betray me, and I explicitly expressed my disapproval. I didn't want our 22-year marriage to be thrown away. However, she went ahead and did it, and you didn't intervene. Instead, you supported her. I'm deeply disheartened by your actions. I wish Terry had learned about it earlier. In retrospect, I should have contacted him, but I didn't want to bring in the family. You also mentioned that she almost faced a significant challenge, but in reality, she was never in much danger. She did have a major life event, but that was where things ended. Our carpe diem plan was intended for both of us. I should have realized that Rose became self-centered, focusing only on her own desires. I drive on a challenging road every day to work, and I've had many close encounters. I could have faced a difficult situation. I'm sorry, Janet, but the understanding you spoke of should have come from Rose. She didn't comprehend how much this affected me, or how I could never view her the same way again. That's very upsetting. I wasn't trying to be overbearing. I was just trying to preserve our relationship. The people at the table shifted in their seats, feeling uneasy as the waitress brought them a new round of beverages. I continued, Rose, you jumped when I said it was a small thing, just one night out of over 8,000. You can try to minimize it, but the impact is significant. This was a major event. You pushed my feelings aside, showed a lack of respect, and all for a little thing, as you call it. You don't respect me or my feelings. You only care about you and Carpe Diem. That's fine now that I know where you stand. I'm not ending 22 years of marriage. I'm working on the next 22 years. Rose was crying. I said, that's all I have. I yield the floor. Everyone just sat silently and listened to Rose crying. She looked up and said, I do respect you. I just made a mistake in judgment. Can't you see we belong together? Do you respect me? I inquired. She acknowledged with a nod and wiped her nose. The bartender passed by, initially smiling, then becoming serious. It was a solemn moment, I'm sure. Give me your phone, I insisted. Why? She questioned, her voice trembling. If I don't find any disrespectful content on your phone, I'll call off the divorce. She attempted to stand up. Where are you going? Rose halted her movement. To the restroom. The deal is off if you take your phone with you. Hand it over now or never. She complied, sitting back down and sliding the phone across the table. I turned it towards her, requiring her fingerprint to gain access. First, I checked her text messages, of course. I didn't see Charlie's name in her contacts. What name is Charlie under? I know you had to be texting, but his name isn't in here. I'll search every single name until I find him, so just tell me. Charlotte, she said, blushing. Thank you. Here we go, the usual stuff friends talk about. Oh, you sent him a picture, not unexpected. Wow, you sent him pictures all the way back to five years ago. Wait, that's when your old phone died. I bet it went further back, didn't it? You know they call this a close friendship. Unless you were doing him then too, but I doubt it. So did you know you were going to almost face a challenge even back then? Or were you just making plans until you found a good reason to support each other for real? I'll just read some highlights now. Bob's expression changes as he reads. Oh, here. Bob has no clue. He's kind of oblivious that way. Let's see. Oh, here we go. 
He's snoring right next to me like a clueless buffoon. Hmm, here's one. I never have enjoyable moments with Bob. He just doesn't do it for me. Oh, here's a winner. I don't love him the way I used to. Bob looks up from the phone. Is everything you said true? Rose shakes her head no. Well, there's plenty more in here, I'm sure, but I've made my point. Bob glances at her phone. Why do you have two calculators on your phone? Rose jumps up and reaches for the phone. No, she whimpers. What's the passcode? Never mind, let me guess. There we go. Oh, now see, here's all the pictures. Whoa, that one is not very nice. Oh, look, a video, quite a long video too from two days ago. Let's see what that is. Rose jumped up. No, don't, please. I'm sure you can get the gist from just the sound. I sent myself a copy of the video on email, then I hit play. It was the night at the hotel. I watched while everyone else listened except Terry who left the table. The first words were, Charlie, I can't believe your husband let you do this, Rose. Well, he was supposed to give me the green light, but I ended up having to overrule him. Charlie. You mean you're cheating on him? Rose. No, I told him what I was doing. I think he'll be fine. Charlie. Hey, let's get more comfortable here. I was looking for some interesting parts to read. All right, so, just to be clear, I added some new experiences to my bucket list, since I've never experienced them. Unfortunately, I had to remove them because Rose said she wasn't comfortable with that. I hit play again. Charlie. Wow, you're really good at this. I'm about to reach a new level of excitement. Oh my, you even handle it with grace. Your husband must be so fortunate. Rose. He is. That's why he'll support me in everything like the amazing husband he is. I think I could keep doing this, and I still feel confident. How about I visit you in Denver sometime? Charlie. Hmm, I'll have to see how you perform first. Terry returned to the table, apologizing for having to step away. I'll just skip the steamy part for now, I said, stopping when the call ended. Charlie. That was great. Let's do it again. How about trying it from behind this time? Rose. Sure, just give me a few minutes to clean up some of this mess. I need to recover a little too. It's a good thing I can't get pregnant anymore, haha. -ha. Charlie. Thanks for setting this up, Michelle. It was really nice of her. Rose. I know, right? Leslie and Joan told her what we were planning, and she wanted to help out. Charlie. Are you enjoying this so far? Rose. Better than I had hoped. You're bigger than Bob, and so much better. I had to stop there. Rose. Is Charlie bigger than me? Rose turned red. No, I just said that. Were you considering breaking our bond after Friday night? Making me feel like I was the one in the wrong? Rose's voice trembled with emotion. I shared untruths with some individuals like Teresa and my mother. I was having such a great time that I began to think you might allow me to pursue my interests like Teresa. Were you spreading unfounded rumors about me? Rose hesitated, then admitted. I told them unfavorable things about you so they would empathize with me. I suppose I was just being overly dramatic. The things I discovered on your phone are disrespectful towards me, and I only scratched the surface. I can't tolerate that level of dishonesty. You tarnished my reputation with people in our community. But more hurtful than deceiving everyone else is deceiving me and our own family. I can't maintain a marriage with someone who behaves that way. I promised you all could respond after you gave me the floor, so now's the time. Does anyone have anything else to say or ask? Rose's family bowed their heads in agreement. Terry shook his head. George opened his briefcase and dropped a large envelope in front of Rose. He said, Rose Lemon, you have been served. Why, Bob? I love you, Rose cried. I have to live for today. Staying married to you is demeaning, and I would never trust you again after all the challenges you faced behind my back. Twenty-two years was a good run, but all of that is tarnished now. You cad. I'm going to take you for everything I can so I can finish my bucket list. Get a lawyer, Rose, Bob advised, before you start counting on things. This isn't a no-fault divorce state. I could bring up infidelity in court, and they might lean heavily in. My favor, when it comes to money. Fury washed over Rose as she shouted, How dare you, Bob! I'll tell the kids what you're doing to me. And if you lie, I'll show them the evidence, just like I did with your family today. I'd be more than happy to leave our kids out of this. You're still their mother, and they don't need to know the details but I suggest you tell them the truth in your own words, without lying. This meeting is over, everyone, Teresa announced, standing up. I'll take care of the bill. Janet and Teresa companion rose out of the restaurant, tears streaming down her face. Terry extended his hand for a handshake. I'm sorry things didn't work out, but I understand. He gave me a comforting hug, picked up the divorce packet, and left. I looked at George and said, gosh, I could use a drink. Let's head up to the bar. I have more to discuss with you, he suggested. I nodded in agreement. 
We sat at the bar, and Amelia approached us. Your lunch date looked intense. I hope it's okay for me to ask, but was that about Friday night? It's fine, I don't mind talking about it. That was my last stand against her family. She's been served, and now I want to celebrate, I explained. Amelia chuckled. So Carpe Diem turned into Celebration Day? Wow, you have a great sense of humor. Too bad you aren't 20 years older, I'd ask you out, I joked. And I'd say yes, but I have a better idea. My mother is beautiful, smart, sexy, and faithful. When you're ready to date again, I could set you up. I know she'd like you. Nice. Give me your number, and I'll contact you after the divorce is settled. She had just given my ego the boost it needed after being hurt by my soon-to-be ex. George cleared his throat. We have more business to cover before you get too carried away. You have excellent grounds for a lawsuit against her employer. They condoned and facilitated her misconduct, and we have proof. Really? Yeah. Let's take legal action. In summary, we pursued legal action against Rose's supervisor for urging Rose to deceive me and employing the firm card to cover the hotel costs. Our case was solid, so they proposed a 75% settlement of our demands. I agreed to the settlement, but insisted on the dismissal of all individuals implicated in organizing the event, including Rose, Charlie, Michelle, and three of Rose's female colleagues. The company verified our allegations by reviewing emails stored on their server. Charlie worked for less than a month in Denver before being let go, well before my divorce began. I received a fair settlement, which made managing my bills much easier now that I was only relying on my income. I was eager to start dating again. Amelia introduced me to her still single mother, Grace. We had dinner and discussed our past relationships, which I initially thought was inappropriate, but I realized I didn't know everything. Grace's husband had passed away from cancer three years prior, and our dinner was her first date since then. Amelia hadn't lied. Grace was quite charming, very attractive, and intelligent enough to engage in fascinating conversations with me about various topics. I gradually asked her out, and we took our time getting closer. One evening, after sharing a few glasses of wine at her place, we became intimate. Grace was an incredible lover, eager to please me while expecting little in return. I occasionally spoke to Rose, who was upset about everyone losing their jobs. She found a new job, paying less but enough for survival. Rose apologized for ruining our marriage, admitting she let others influence her decisions. She regretted not realizing the mistake sooner. I allowed Rose to explain the situation to our children, who were uninvolved until our divorce. I confirmed that she provided them with accurate information, which must have been embarrassing for her. Carpe diem became a challenge for Rose as she was struggling financially. I persisted in pursuing my dreams with Grace's help. We completed the trips I had initially planned with Rose. Rose learned about our adventures and was not happy. We decided to return to Europe, as Grace had never been there before. I encouraged Grace to create her own bucket list to continue the journey Rose had initiated. To my surprise, Grace's list included some intimate items, so I added a few more to mine. Grace moved in with me, and I reduced my work hours as I now had the means to spend more time with her, cherishing each day together. The end.